Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Kriko. Phenomenal uh, talk. So good morning, everyone. I am Professor Leah Cowan, Vice President Research and Innovation and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Toronto, and I'm thrilled to join you as the chair for the rest of session one today. Our first early career investigator speaker is Professor Anna Blakeney, who is Assistant Professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering at the Michael Smith Laboratories of the University of British Columbia. Professor Blakeney was selected by Drs. Peter Cullis, Catalin Carrico, Drew Weissman for her next generation RNA vaccines and therapeutics research. And I am absolutely delighted to turn it over to Professor Blakeney. Over to you. Excellent. Well, it is truly my honor to be here today. So thanks to Gerner and Katy and Drew and Peter for selecting me. It's really a really exciting opportunity for me. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my work at University of British Columbia. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on this beautiful campus in Vancouver in BC, uh, which is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And obviously, it's been a really exciting time to work in the field of RNA, as Katy uh, so beautifully uh, set, set me up for this presentation. And so I like to say the plane is off the ground. You know, a few years ago when I would get talks, I would have to tell everybody what RNA vaccines were and try to convince them that, that they are working. But I think obviously we've seen it's come a long way in just the past few years. And this is really due to the efforts of Drew and Katy and Peter. They've really set the stage for the work that I and many others are doing now in the field of RNA vaccines and therapies. So where do we go from here? So my lab at UBC uh, really focuses on a few different aspects of this RNA research. So we work on RNA molecular engineering. So how do we design better RNA that uh, results in higher amounts of protein expression? Of course, the biomaterials design. So how do we get these large negatively charged molecules into cells more efficiently and into the cells and tissues that we want the uh, therapeutic to be in? As well as thinking about better vaccines and others, other applications for this technology. So uh, other vaccines such as bacterial antigens, um, and gaining an improved understanding of the immune response, as well as expressing monoclonal antibodies, which could be used for uh, treating cancer or preventing disease. So we've all uh, are very well aware now that the safety and the efficacy of the mRNA vaccines have been very well proven against COVID-19. So this is some of the data from the Pfizer and BioNTech trial, which um, really, I think, blew everybody out of the water as far as how effective it was. I'm not sure anybody was quite expecting it to be um, as high as effective as 95% protection with just the two-dose regimen. And we've really seen that, you know, compared to the placebo, we have a really high efficacy rate, um, which is super encouraging for those in the fields as obviously before uh, COVID-19, nobody had ever done a phase three trial for RNA before. Um, in addition, you know, the safety over a median of two months from this paper um, that was published initially was you know, similar to that of other viral vaccines. And so it got this glowing report. And obviously now billions of people have taken these vaccines. So where do we go from here? So one of the priority areas in the field is really thinking about ways to reduce the dose of RNA. So this is actually some uh, data from one of Moderna's clinical trial where they looked at using three different doses of RNA. So 25, 100, and 250 micrograms. And there's a lot of data here, but you can see that they've categorized the side effects as mild, moderate, and severe. And what's you know, very visually apparent from this data is that as you increase the dose of, a, of RNA, you're also increasing the frequency and severity of the side effects. So we now understand that the dose of RNA is directly correlated to the frequency and severity of these side effects. And this, this means that minimizing the dose of RNA is really required for use of mRNA vaccines in non-pandemic contexts, as well as for other applications such as therapeutics. So one of the ways we're able to do this is uh, what, with what my lab works on, which is called self-amplifying RNA. So at the very top, we have uh, the structure of a conventional mRNA. As Katy said, we have the five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail, as well as an untranslated region at the five prime and three prime ends. For self-amplifying RNA, many of the structures are very similar. We have a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail, as well as a five prime and three prime UTR. But we also have these four non-structural proteins, which are typically derived from an alpha virus and make up a replicase. So what this means for the self-amplifying RNA is that it's actually able to make copies of itself once it gets into a cell. So on the right, we have um, a typical mRNA. Once it enters a cell, it engages with the ribosome, and you get translation of your antigen. 
Self-amplifying RNA starts out very similarly. Once a copy gets into a cell, it engages with the ribosome. You do get some uh, translation of your antigen from that initial engagement, but it also translates its replicase. So the replicase goes back to that original strand and makes many uh, exact copies of it. For the sake of this very simplified schematic, I just have three, but it actually makes thousands of copies in the cell. And so this results in a much higher level of protein expression from the same initial dose of RNA. So what this means is that uh, typically we're able to use about 100 times less saRNA compared to um, traditional messenger RNA. So one of the things we really think about is how does the innate immune system sense these RNA and the delivery vehicles and how can we really engineer ways around this? So um, this is from a review that Norbert Party wrote in 2018 and um, I always think back to this for a number of reasons. One is, you know, we know all these ways that RNA is sensed in this cell, right? So endosomal sensing with TLR3, 7, and 8 and cytosolic sensing with some common ones like MD85 and RIG-I. Um, but on the right we have this idea of carrier sensing and there's just a big question mark. So we have a pretty good idea of how the uh, RNA is sensed, but we're still learning a lot about how these delivery vehicles are sensed by cells. And this is a lot of the work that Katy and Drew have done, is thinking about ways that we can navigate around this uh, type 1 interferon sensing, which is kind of a double-edged sword for RNA. So it leads to a good vaccine immune response, but it can also completely shut down the protein translation within the cell. So one of the things we have done, and I'll, I'll just uh, tell a, sh a very short story about our research today, is think about uh, incorporating these virally derived interferon inhibiting proteins directly into our RNA. So at the top is our wild type replicon or saRNA, and at the bottom we screen through a number of interferon inhibiting proteins or IIPs. So many viruses have naturally evolved to have these two because they have the same issue uh, introducing foreign RNA. So uh, one of the things we did was to screen through this, and it's encoded directly in the same RNA, so we guarantee that this protein is always being expressed in the cell where we have the RNA. Uh, so one of the things that we saw from this is we were actually able to, sc uh, to screen this in human skin explants. And as anybody who's worked with RNA has probably observed before is that as you increase the dose, it doesn't have a linear dose response. It actually has a parabolic dose response where once you get to a point where further increasing the dose does not increase the protein expression that you see. So in this case, we were looking at kind of our two lead candidates. So our EGFP is just our wild type and then PIV5 and MERS-CoV-2 or ORA4A. And in order to uh, look at the protein expression, we looked at the percentage of GFP positive cells at three different doses of the RNA. So 0.2, 2, and 20 micrograms. And you can see all, all the um, groups are about similar for the 0.2 and 2 microgram dose, and there's a slight increase in the number of GFP positive cells. But as we uh, go up to the 20 microgram dose, we see the wild type drop off, and we actually have even fewer GFP positive cells um, than the 0.2 microgram dose. Whereas for our saRNA, that has as the interferon inhibiting proteins incorporated into it, we actually see a higher number of GFP positive cells, telling us that by inhibiting this interferon pathway, we're actually getting uh, good protein expression with increasing the dose. So we use this also in a, a vaccine model to see, you know, we're seeing more protein expression, but does this also increase the vaccine immune response that we're seeing? So we did this in this case with a rabies vaccine. So on the left, we looked at the antibody titers, the IgG, as determined by ELISA. And on the right, we looked at the neutralization. And um, in this case, we were using just one of the uh, IIPs, which is called ORF4A. And the rabbits got two injections in this case at zero and four weeks. And we looked at the antibodies at four and six weeks after the um, uh, injections, and you can see for the um, wild type group that we get a good antibody response, about 10 to the fourth nanograms per mil, but with our IIP, we get almost an order to magnet, order of magnitude higher antibody response, indicating that not only is this uh, yield increased protein expression, but also a better vaccine immune response. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about as well is science communication, so I just wanted to touch on this a little bit. Um, but in January 2020, there were still very few scientists that knew about the RNA vaccines, and now billions of people have gotten them. And I think many of us can attest to that there's been a, quite a PR problem for the RNA vaccines over the pandemic. And so this is one of the things that I'm trying to change. So I started a TikTok channel that's dedicated to educating people about vaccines. Um, and I think you know something that I've noticed is that there's just a significant gap between 
between the research that happens and what the public knows about. And so I think as scientists, we can all do a better job of communicating exactly what we're doing so that people aren't surprised by these uh, technologies when they come out. So one of the things I've done is um, Katy, Drew, and Peter have all been, um, I'm not sure if it's honorees or victims of the TikTok channel, um, but I've I'll tried to highlight all the work that they've done just because I think people really appreciate scientists, but they also have no idea who they are. So part of my mission is to make more scientists household names. Um, and you can see from the comments on the right, this was uh, from one of the videos with Peter, that people are so appreciative. They say, like, so grateful to you people, and I would love to get it. I just got my second dose an hour ago. And so there's really been um, kind of an amazing recognition, which has been really cool to see. Uh, so with that, I just wanted to conclude that we've seen these mRNA vaccines have completely revolutionized the way that we're able to respond to pandemics in part of, uh, from contributions from Katy, Drew, and Peter. Uh, I think for the next generation RNA, thinking about modul modulating this innate sensing in the immune response is imperative to improving these both on the vaccine side and using these for therapeutics as well. And for uh, the science communication side, I think it's important to keep in mind that public engagement really helps to close the gap between the research and, and what the public is aware of, which helps when we try to implement these technologies. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody in my lab and collaborators, as well as Gardner um, for having me here. It's, it's really my pleasure, as well as our funding sources for the lab. And with that, I will take any questions.